as always. Are you ready for the word this morning? That was good. Open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 11. And before we actually get into the text, I'm going to give a little background. I like to go back a little bit to remind us where we left off. So as we're moving forward, we're all unified together in the same mind, same thought, same page. So we've been studying through the book of Acts. This is the book where the Acts of the Apostles is recorded. This is the book where it begins with Jesus ascending to heaven. And in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit descending in the upper room. Those were filled with the Spirit. And then the Spirit began to move upon all flesh. The gospel was preached with power and authority. We know that as we've navigated through these chapters, we've seen many things. Signs, wonders, miracles, persecution. But we've, what we've seen more than anything else is the church expand and grow. Even in the midst of great persecution, the church grew. How many of you know this? That's all the part of God's plan. Amen? God in His sovereignty knows the beginning from the end. And He knew that when persecution would come to the church, He would use it for good. And that's exactly what happened. We've been seeing over the past several chapters where non-Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles have been called by God, had been saved, heard the gospel, responded to the good news, and the church is expanding. And the leadership, the apostles, those who God specifically called, to, anointed and appointed them to be leaders of the church, how they were the witnesses of this move of God with the Samaritans, with the Gentiles, and that's what we've been seeing throughout these books. We've been seeing the Holy Spirit move. Last week we read in chapter 11, Peter reports at Jerusalem, and Peter went and gave the report about what God was doing with the Gentiles. Peter shared the vision that he had that God gave him regarding Cornelius, regarding food, regarding partaking of what the Gentiles eat. He showed him that the Holy Spirit was not just given to the Jew alone. The gospel was not just to the Jew, first to the Jew, but then to the Gentile, then to every other tribe, tongue, and nation. And that's what we've been reading and studying as we've been navigating through this book of Acts. The Holy Spirit, who is God, is doing His work in and through His apostles and through the believers. And as the church expands, we're seeing the work of the Holy Spirit expanding. And now the Spirit is using others to proclaim the message of of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came for one purpose, to die for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried for three days according to the scriptures and he was resurrected in according to the scriptures. And it's through the, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can have life, amen? That we can have an intimate personal relationship with God. It's only through the Son, it's only through Christ alone. That's why the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is the most important message for every single human being to hear. Amen? Especially as the world prog progressively gets darker, and it is getting darker. As we see the signs of the times, as we see, as I shared almost every week from this pulpit, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, as we see these things increase, we know that these are the birth pains, the beginning of what is coming. So we have to be ready. When we prayed earlier, we talked about being ready in season and out of season. Our requirement as believers is to be ready for whatever comes because our message is the same message that Jesus has. Amen? Jesus said in the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now I say he commanded us to go and preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all the ways of the Lord. Amen? That's what we're called to do when a church is focused on Jesus, when he is the central message, the church is protected, blessed, favored, because Christ blesses those he loves, he protects those he loves. That doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. That doesn't mean we're not going to go through persecution. It means the opposite, that through suffering and persecution, we are being perfected, we are becoming more like Christ, and Christ is using us for His glory, and His glory is always to expand His kingdom. If you're following me, say amen. amen. When you come to Christ, know this, it's not about you anymore, it's all about Him. You come off the throne and He goes on the throne. 
We are called to be ambassadors, stewards, and servants for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we get into the text today, and as you know, I always read from the Amplified. It's an expounded version. It has, it has commentary in the verses. I like that so I could explain it in the short period of time that I have with you. I'm going to use the Amplified, and I'm also going to use some commentary notes and some other information to share with you and give you to bless you so you can have a greater understanding of Scripture. So the purpose here is for you to hear the Word, grasp it, and then respond to it. What we receive through the Holy Spirit and through the Word is truth and life. As we partake of it, as we ingest it, as the Spirit and the Word become one in us, we become a greater conduit of blessing to this lost and dying world. Amen? Jesus said this, you're not to put a light under a bushel. A light is to be shown so everybody can see it. The darker the days are, the brighter the light of Christ needs to shine. And the people of God, through the wisdom, discernment of the Word and the Holy Spirit, have the ability to be lights in the darkest darkness. Do you know that today? That's what gets me excited about this year. Whatever happens, I don't know what's going to happen. God does. We'll be prepared for in the spirit realm and through the word. Whatever's going to take place, God will give us the ability to be light in darkness. That's where our heart should be. After the Father's heart, seeking the Father's will. And he'll give us what we need. The Bible says very clearly that God shall supply for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? Not your wants, not your greeds, not your own self-interests, not things that you think are very important. What God says you need, you will have because he's the supplier. Amen? All right, let's begin. Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19. We're going to read through 19 through 30, then we're going to go back up and reflect upon it and respond to it. Follow me as I read it. The church at Antioch. So then since they were unaware of these developments, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with the stoning of Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. We're going to learn a little bit about those places a little later. So the persecution of the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr, scattered the church, but yet the Holy Spirit was with them. Amen? And he that is in them was greater than he that is in the world. So once they were scattered, what do you think they started doing? Talking about the Lord. Sharing the gospel. So God was using the scattering for his purposes. I'm going to read that again, verse 19. So then since they were unaware of these developments, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with the stoning of Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch without telling the message of salvation through Christ to anyone except Jews. So this is important. Jesus came first to the Jew. The ministry of the disciples, the, the, the apostles first was for the Jew. And until the Holy Spirit showed them different, that was their primary target audience. That's what we're reading here. Verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, proclaiming to them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. So here it goes. The gospel is now going beyond just the Jew. Verse 21, And the hand and power and presence of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord for salvation, accepting and drawing near to Jesus as Messiah and Savior. Isn't it interesting? What do we need to do to be saved? Repent and turn. Repentance is not just confession. It's not just saying I'm guilty. It's acknowledging that we need God and we have to live for God. So when we truly repent, we turn to the Lord. So we see that here. They turned to the Lord. Verse 22, the news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So they sent one of their own to confirm what was happening. They sent somebody who had understanding, someone who was an elder, someone who was filled with the Holy Spirit. A man like Barnabas was sent to Antioch to make sure that this work was valid and genuine. That's what we see here. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw the grace of God that was bestowed upon them, how are we saved? Through grace 
and faith, not by works, that no one should boast. It's a gift of God. So the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, was poured out. That's what it says here. Was bestowed upon them. He rejoiced and began to encourage them with all an unwavering heart to stay true and devoted to the Lord. So he began to encourage them because he saw it was a genuine encounter with the Lord. Verse 24, for Barnabas was a good man privately and publicly. His godly character benefited both himself and others, and he was full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith in Jesus the Messiah, through whom believers have everlasting life. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So here's an evangelism explosion, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit is coming not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And the, the, the favor of the Lord is coming upon the people. Verse 25, And Barnabas left for Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. For an entire year, they met with others in the church and instructed large numbers. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to get a little bit deeper in that a little bit later. But know this, Paul, Saul, before he became Paul, they're still using his name as Saul here, had that Damascus Road encounter, was filled with the Holy Spirit, began to witness in the synagogues immediately. Persecution came up against him strongly. They had to tell him to go back and, and basically hide for a while. And we're going to see this as I share a little bit later. For many years, it was over 12 years that Paul was in Tarsus getting educated in the Scriptures, familiarizing himself with the Lord and spending time in God's presence. There was a preparation period before he took on the role of Paul the Apostle and started overseeing the churches. Barnabas knew the man that he was, knew the wisdom and knowledge that he has, and sought out for him. So he searched for him. And when he found him, verse 26 he brought him back to Antioch. For an entire year they met with others in the church and instructed large numbers. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Verse 27, now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So the prophetic gift was poured out through the Holy Spirit. And some prophets came down from Antioch, to, from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and prophesied through the Holy Spirit, that a severe famine would come on the entire world. And this did happen during the reign of Claudius. So a true prophet will prophesy something that will come to pass. He prophesied it, it came to pass. So the disciples decided to send a contribution, each one according to his individual ability, to the believers who lived in Judea. And this they did, sending the contribution to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So we see here the unity of the church. There, there's so much we could take away, and I'm going to go back up to the first three verses and expound on it a little bit so we can get a deeper revelation and deeper teaching of what we just read in the Word. In verses 19 to 21, I read to you that the preaching of the Word was to no one but the Jews only in the beginning. At first when the believers, the followers of the way, were scattered over the Roman Empire, they preached only to Jews, but they eventually began to preach Jesus Christ to Gentiles as well. We've seen that, not just in this chapter, what I just read, but in the previous chapters, we've seen that Samaritans, Gentiles, have come to Christ. We see that. Some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. They spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. So these unnamed disciples from Cyprus and Cyrene are genuine heroes. They began the first mentioned mission to the Gentiles, here called Hellenists in Antioch. So the first thing that they did was they received the message, and now they start sharing the message. Isn't that what evangelism is? What we receive by faith, what we know to be true, we now share with others. So evangelism is sharing the gospel with others. And that's what they were doing. They began to share the gospel. Though they were persecuted, though they were pushed out of Jerusalem and Judea, they fled northward, and we read in these verses to three different places. I'm going to cover them quickly with you. First one was Phoenicia. Phoenicia was a coastal region directly north of Judea, containing the trading ports of Tyre and Sidon. The next place was Cyprus. Cyprus was the third largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, after Sicily and Sardinia. 
Many of you know that my pastor, Pastor Andreas, is from Cyprus. That's where he lives. That's where he's from, Cyprus. So Cyprus is the third largest island in the Mediterranean Sea. Antioch is the place where they encamped. And this is what we're going to talk about the most, so I'm going to expound more on Antioch. We have the first example of Christians deliberately targeting Gentiles for evangelism. And this effort had great results. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. Now, we heard about Cornelius. We heard about the Samaritans. A little different here because the Bible says Cornelius was a devout man. Even though he wasn't a Jew, he already believed in the Jewish God. And the Holy Spirit gave him a vision. The Holy Spirit gave him a revelation, gave Peter a revelation, did a divine setup. Cornelius and his household were saved and baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, these are not devout men that weren't Jews. These are totally Gentiles, secular, pagan Gentiles. So they now are receiving the word of God, and a great number, the Scripture says, believed and turned to the Lord. Let me tell you a little bit more about Antioch, just so you have the the proper understanding of the context, climate, and culture. When Antioch was founded about 300 B.C., Seleucus, one of the inheritors of Alexander the Great's empire, he was the one who founded it, he liked to make a city and name them after his father, Antioch. And he did this about 15 times. This city of Antioch was called Syrian Antioch, or Antioch on the Orontes. In the first century, it was a city of more than half a million people. Today, it's a Turkish city with a population of about 3,500. So today, the city is basically barren. Back then, it was a bustling, thriving city. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Antioch was about 300 miles north of Jerusalem and about 20 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. Many considered Syrian Antioch the third greatest city in the Roman Empire. Remember, Rome was the one in charge. Rome had the empire. They had all the provinces and all the lands. And Antioch was the third greatest city behind Rome and Alexandria. Antioch was known for its business and commerce, for its sophistication and culture, but also for its immorality. So this was a very immoral place. There was a lot of hustle and bustle going on there, a lot of wheeling and dealing, a lot of pagan idolatry and worship that was not of God, immoral. Now, I hear a lot of people on the Internet saying, I want to get out of this God-forsaken city, this state, New York. Where do you think God needs us? Where do you think God needs the church? Where do you think God needs the Word and the Holy Spirit to move? Amen? Amen? We don't want to run away from where God's calling us to be. We want to fight the good fight of faith. We want to be armed with the Spirit and ready for battle. God did a great move in Antioch. Do you believe God can do a great move in New York? I hope so. Praise God. So the city's reputation for moral laxity was enhanced by the cult of Artemis and Apollo at Daphne, five miles distant where the ancient Syrian worship of Astarte and her consort with its ritual prostitution was carried on. So there was ritual prostitution. A lot of the worship in those days was you'd go into these temples and actually sleep with prostitutes to get answers to your prayers. That's what they were used to. That's what took place. That's the bottom line. The city's reputation According to Hughes, when the ancient Roman senator Juvenal wanted to describe the decadence of Rome, he said that the Orontes has flowed into the Tiber, flooding Rome with wickedness. So this was a wicked city. It was wicked. One might say that Jerusalem was all about religion. Rome was all about power. Alexandria was all about intellect. Athens was all about philosophy. Adding to that, one might say that Antioch was all about business and immorality. That's the type of place it was. And this is where the gospel exploded. This is where evangelism exploded. In the depths of morality and wickedness, the word, the light was spoken, and people responded to the light. Amen? When the gospel came to Cornelius, he became a follower of Jesus. 
It came to a man who was already a God-fearer. I already said that. He had a respect for the God of Israel and lived a moral life. When it came to Antioch, it utterly came into a pagan city. Because God was with them, their ministry was blessed and multiplied. The result was that a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Amen? A great number heard it and received it. A ministry can't turn people to the Lord unless the hand of the Lord is with them. You can turn a people to a personality without the hand of God. You can turn a people to a social club without the hand of God. You can turn a people to a church or an institution without the hand of the Lord. But you can't turn people to the Lord without the hand of the Lord. They're sent by God, filled with the Spirit for one purpose, to lead people towards the truth. The phrase believed and turned to the Lord is a good description of both the work of faith and repentance. So believing and turning to the Lord means not only did they hear the message, but they repented and now became a follower, a disciple of the message. That's what happens when someone truly repents and turns. They become a follower of Jesus. So in, in, in verses 22 to 24... They sent out Barnabas. The church in Jerusalem sent down an able man in Barnabas, previously known for his generosity. We read that back in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. And his warm acceptance of Saul of Tarsus after he was converted in Acts 9, 26 and 28. If you remember when Saul was first converted, the other apostles weren't having it. They were like, this guy was our number one persecutor. We can't trust him. Barnabas was the one who said, no, he's, he's genuine. He's of God, and they received Saul, being of God. So we know that about Barnabas. So news is always getting back to Jerusalem, and I suppose it was always this way. Whenever anything is done, there is somebody who will run to those who are supposed to be important and say, do you know what's going on in Antioch? And because Jerusalem was the hub, that's where the apostles, the church was established, They always ran back there to tell him what's going on in other places. So when he came and seen the grace of God, he was glad. At the church in Antioch, when Barnabas had seen the grace of God and was glad, he confirmed it. There was something in the work and atmosphere among the followers of Jesus in Antioch that made Barnabas able to see the grace of God. Amen? And it's the grace of God that he saw. The love, the mercy, the grace, the joy, the peace of God that filled the atmosphere of that place. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is truly freedom. Amen? So in whatever gathering of Christians we associate ourselves with, it's important that we're able to see the grace of God among us. They should not see an emphasis on self or man-made rules or human performance, but on the glorious grace of God, and it will make us glad. If we understand that this is Christ's church, not our church, and if we willingly walk in obedience to his word, his will, his spirit, he'll bless us. That's the fruits of obedience. Obedience precedes blessing. Again, I don't want to say that does not mean we're not going to suffer and go through hardships and difficulties and trials, but the spirit of God, he that lives in us, is greater than he that is in the world. And it is the Holy Spirit's presence that gives us the ability to rise above the human presence of emotion, feeling, betrayal. And we walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, and we can have joy and peace in the midst of the storms of life. And that's what God gives us in and through his spirit. So, Barnabas encouraged them in all that he saw with a purpose of heart that they would continue in the Lord. He wanted to make sure that they would continue serving Jesus. And he focused this as his main job as the leader of that body of new believers, that congregation. He strengthened the church family itself with the result a great many were added to the church. So under Barnabas' leadership, more came in to the fellowship. Amen? As we continue to navigate through this chapter, verses 25 and 26 talk about Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Now this is interesting. He saw the work, he saw the fruit of it, and now he said, I need help. I know who to get. I'm going to go get Saul. So Barnabas remembered Saul, and he was sent to Tarsus 
for his own protection in Acts chapter 9, verses 28 to 30, Saul fled to Tarsus because they wanted to kill him. If you remember, he had to flee in a basket being lowered down from, from a high height, and then he had to go to Tarsus because they wanted to kill him. So Barnabas had to look for him. So to seek Saul, I want to emphasize the importance of this, was really meaning he had to hunt for him. He had to really go look for him. Barnabas had to do some looking. It's, it's, it suggests here from the original language that this was a laborious search. This was not something. He didn't find him right away. He had to go digging for him, but eventually he did find him. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And it says so that it was for a whole year that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. So together, Barnabas and Saul taught a great many people, making the church in Antioch strong. But I want to remind you about something. Saul spent some 12 years in Tarsus from the last time Barnabas was with him. 12 years. These years were not wasted or lost, but he spent them in quiet ministry and preparation for his future service. God is always going to prepare those he's calling to great works. Amen? Moses was under Pharaoh and his leadership for years. That was part of his training. And then after he had the skill and military training, when God called him out, he had to go in the wilderness for 40 years and get humbled and seek God intimately and learn intimately the ways of God. Some of the things that he learned had to be removed from him, and God replaced some of them and filled him with wisdom and humility so he can be ready for the task that God had for him. There are seasons in life. There are seasons of preparation. And if you're called, know this, you're going to go through the fire. If you're called, know this, you've got to come under leadership and accountability. If you're called, know this, there's going to be a period of testing, and it's not going to be easy. The greater the call, the harder the testing. So, all this in Antioch because a center for great teaching and preaching was established there. Antioch had the greatest preachers in the first century. They had Barnabas, Saul, and Peter. In the second century, they had Ignatius and Telophilus. In the third and fourth century, they had Lucian, Theodore, Christostom, and Theodoret. So this city that was a cesspool of sin, the Spirit of God comes, a spirit of evangelism comes over the city, there's repentance, there's turning to God, there's equipping. How many of you know that after you get saved, you got to be equipped? And by teachers who know the Word, so you can be equipped properly by teachers who are tested themselves and have endured through trials and persecutions and hardships of all kinds. These aren't my words. These are the words of Scripture. Sometimes we don't like what we hear, but it's the truth, and we need to hear it. The Bible tells us this, teaches us these things, so we can learn and grow. But listen, here's another great truth about Antioch. There was a lot of informal preaching, too. There were Gentile converts who fled because of persecution, and they were filled with the Spirit too, and guess what they did? They went out into the highways and byways and preached the gospel, and people got saved. Isn't that awesome? God uses all of us at different seasons and times in our life. We don't have to know everything to be used by God. If you're born again, if you're filled with the Spirit, God can use you. You have a testimony. Amen? You could tell people the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? And they did, but this is the order and the authority of the church, and you've been hearing me say this for months. Authority, alignment, obedience. The Lord made sure that there was good, solid teaching there for over a year to equip these babies and new people in the faith with proper, sound doctrine. And then they went out and checked on them and kept coming back as they equipped them and mentored them and raised up leaders from their midst. That was the process for the church to grow decently and in order. Amen? So it wasn't just chaos. There was order. There was teaching. There was a process for the growth and maturity of the believers in the body of Christ. And again, we learn here that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. This is the first time we hear Christian. It wasn't until these years 
that the church in, in Syrian Antioch, that the name Christian became associated with the followers of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, they were called disciples. In Acts chapter 9, they were called saints. In Acts chapter 5, they were called believers. In Acts chapter 6, they were called brothers. In Acts chapter 5, again, they were called witnesses. In Acts chapter 9, they were called followers of the way. And in Acts chapter 24, which we didn't get, get there yet, they would be called Nazarenes. But here, now, they would be called Christians. So what does that mean when someone calls you a Christian? In Latin, the ending I-A-N meant the party of. A Christian, a Christ-E-N, was the party of Jesus. Christians was sort of like saying Jesusites or Jesus people, describing the people associated with Jesus Christ. So the idea was that they were called the Christ's ones. Now, why would they be called that if there wasn't a resemblance to Christ? Do you understand there was an identity? They gave them that name because of their identity. They gave them that name because what they received from Christ, the Word and the Spirit, they were now exemplifying. They were living. They were followers of Jesus. They were different. How could we make a mark in this world? How could we be true disciples of Christ? How could we be true evangelists if our life looks no different than the world? How could we truly show people the love of Jesus Christ and what we surrender to and receive through grace and faith if we're not people of forgiveness and mercy and grace? If we're not people with a heart for the lost that have a desire to go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in, to, to get involved, to use the wisdom, the creative wisdom of the Holy Spirit to draw people towards Jesus. Remember, God's the only one who saves people. The Holy Spirit is who draws them. He was sent to the church. We're filled with the Spirit. God's working on people's hearts. There's divine connections, divine appointments. And God's looking for us to use us, but when we look like Him, as we're being sanctified, we're not perfect, as we're being sanctified, as we're being transformed, the goal is to become more like Jesus. And the people see the Christ in you. And that's what draws them to Jesus. And you point them to Jesus. So there's, a, there's an order of things here. There's a way that the Lord is teaching the, the first Christians how to act and be in love so that they can represent the church. So what's the purpose for the church? Why is this building standing here? Why is there a body of believers? Let's turn quickly in the Bible because it lines up with what we're learning here to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I want to look at verses 11 to 16. Turn there with me. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16. This is the plan for church growth spoken of in Acts here. When, when Barnabas and Saul established the church and taught there for a year, this is what the purpose is. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles, special messengers, representatives, some as prophets who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, and some as pastors and teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. And he did this to fully equip and perfect to saints. So what's the purpose for divine leadership? To fully equip and perfect the saints. That's the purpose of it. God's people for works of service to build up the body of Christ, the church, until we all reach oneness in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing spiritually to become a mature believer reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity. Amen? Everything done under the authority of God is done in unity and harmony. All the pieces of the body fit together hand and foot. Everybody works together for one purpose, to glorify God the Father in and through the Son, Jesus Christ. Are you getting this? 
This is why the church is the hub, the resource center. This is why the church has pastors and teachers. This is why the church is where the the body, the sheep who hear the message get fed. This is why we have discipleship classes. This is why we have Bible studies. This is why we have foundation classes. So that the word gets in your mind and in your heart and you become mature and complete, lacking nothing. It's a process. It's a slow process. But it begins with the church. The church of Jesus Christ. This is his church, his order, his word. Amen? Let's continue. So that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, tossed back and forth like ships in a stormy sea, and carry about by every wind of shifting doctrine, by the cunning and trick- trickery of unscrupulous men, by the deceitful scheming of people ready to do anything for personal profit. And believe me, there's a lot of them out there today. There's a lot of false teaching and false prophet, prophets out there that are after selfish gain and that twist and manipulate the truth to deceive even the elect if possible. This is why God established His church. This is why sound doctrine and teaching is needed. This is why the Word and the Spirit are one. Amen? Let's continue. But speaking the truth in love in all things... Both our speech and our lives, expressing his truth, let us grow up in all things into him, following his example, who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, the church, in all its various parts, joined and knitted together firmly by what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly, it causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in what? Unselfish love. We're not promoting a man and looking at the giftings and talents, abilities of the man. We're not promoting anything other than Christ. We're not promoting each others, each other with our gifts and, and focusing on gifts and talents. No. Everything is done in unity, harmony, and humility, all to become one in Christ. That's the purpose. So leaders in the church dedicate themselves to building strong, healthy Christians. As the saints are equipped for the work of the ministry, they grow into maturity and do their ministry, and it causes the growth of the body. If a church is healthy, it will grow. If a church is healthy, it will grow. If the sheep are getting fed, sheep begat sheep. They'll tell other sheep, there's good food over here. Come and and partake of it. Christ is here. The Word is here. The Spirit is here. Sheep begat sheep. So back to Acts. Back to Barnabas. He, he departed and, and sought out Saul for a reason. So that the people can be educated in the truth. Isn't it amazing that Saul, who becomes Paul, wrote most of the New Testament, and what he did so masterfully was to be able to take the principles, the laws, the statutes of the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, and present them in such a way, with such order, eloquence, and simplicity, that even a non-Jew, a pagan Gentile, who has no understanding can receive it as truth. God had a specific call on his life to do a specific task, but he was the one who, who had the, 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 the training from the Lord himself because of his background and everything he went through to be able to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Amen? Do you see how everything works in perfect order, unity, and harmony in Scripture? Do you see how it's not fragmented? There's not chaos? It's not 50 people running in 50 directions? Everything is done decently and in order so that the church can be mature and complete, lacking nothing, that the believers, the new converts, can be saved and discipled and then sent out, and as they know the truth, they can go out and share the good news. They're getting good, solid, practical teaching from leaders who are equipped, and they themselves are filled with the Holy Spirit and being used by God to lead others to Christ. Amen? Isn't that what God wants to do with us? That's the goal. That's the goal. So as we navigate through this chapter, I'm going to wrap up down verses 27 through 30. There was prophets that were shown in the Spirit that there would be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So we don't know how Agabus, who was a prophet, showed by the Spirit this famine, 
was on the way, but the Christians took the word seriously and generously prepared to meet the coming need. So they received his word as a word of the Lord. He was a man, I guess, who was tested and proved. They recognized him as a prophet, a man of God, a man filled with the Spirit, a man who was tested. And the people were in unity. And they gave according to their ability and their resources. And those who had more gave more. It was proportional giving. So according to their ability. That's how the church works, right? Some of us, God blesses the ability to earn a lot and to be blessed with certain talents and abilities. And the more you earn, the more you're able to give. What does the word blessed mean in the Hebrew? Barak. It means to be blessed. you got to be a blessing. So it's not to covet. It's you can be blessed and, and, and have things in your life. But when you're truly a blessing serving God, and when you've been given those gifts and abilities, you take what you have and you give it out. And you use it for kingdom purposes. And that's what they did here. They sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The high regard that Barnabas and Saul had among all was evident by the fact that they were trusted with the relief fund. They knew a famine was going to come. They prepared for it, and they gave to all who had need. Those who had more gave more. Those who had left gave less. But it took care of everybody's need. So the church continued to grow. In which ways? In numbers, evangelism, in wisdom and truth, discipleship, and in faith and giving, obedience. Isn't that awesome? That's what took place in this portion of Scripture in the book of Acts. So I'm here to, to echo the words that we just read here that were written by Luke, that when we are filled with the Spirit, we're ready for whatever's going to come. When we are filled with the Spirit, our mission field is where God plants us. Not where we want to run to, but where God calls you to. Amen? Bloom while you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. Let the Lord get the glory. Even if that includes suffering and hardship and difficulty, it's just for a season. Because ultimately, where do we wind up? With Jesus forever. And that's the best place to be. Amen? We live in a temporal world right now. But we are eternal because of the Spirit of God. And we are to have eternal purposes. Seek first the kingdom of God in all its righteousness, and then all else shall be added unto you. So what are some of the takeaways from what we read in this chapter? Be ready to be used by God. Don't worry about the circumstances and surroundings that you're living in. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. God will give you opportunity to be a blessing and to be light and salt in darkness if you allow him to. Don't hide your light under a bush. Don't tuck and run and hide. Be out there. And ask for the creative wisdom of the Holy Spirit to direct your path each and every day. God will give you creative wisdom. Don't complain and murmur and whine like the world. If you're doing that, you just ruined your testimony. Now I'm telling you the truth, and sometimes the truth hurts. But the truth is what sets us free. And Jesus said, I've come to set captives free. Amen? Worship team, come forward. As we close the service, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we do it often, as the Bible says, for one purpose, to remember what Jesus did for us. May we never forget the cross. May we never forget the suffering that Jesus had to go through for your sake and my sake. May we never forget that Jesus was born perfect and sinless. And yet he took, upon, he took our sin upon himself. When we're going through difficulties and hardships and trials, and we're feeling sorry for ourselves, or we feel overwhelmed, remember what Jesus went through for you. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was sweating drops of blood, and he said to his Father, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup from me. And then remember his words where he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Remember that the next time you're going through a hard trial and you don't understand why and you think it's too long and too hard and, and, and you don't know why God isn't pulling you out of it, remember there's a time and a season and a reason for everything.
Remember what it says in Ephesians, when you've done all you can do, stand and stand firm. Amen. And let God receive the glory even in suffering. So as we reflect on the cross, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and it is a celebration because without Jesus suffering and dying for your sins and my sins, there is no resurrection. There is no eternal life for me and you. We're dead in our trespasses to God. We are only made alive through Jesus the Son. So let's just take a moment right now, a sacred moment, to make sure that before we partake of these elements, there's nothing in us that's prideful or greedy or selfish or envious or covetous or jealous. That's our flesh. The Lord's death and resurrection gives us the ability to put our flesh to death daily. Because of what Jesus did on that cross, we can repent and turn. When the Bible says, do not receive the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, what that means is, don't take for granted what Jesus had to go through for your sin. And make sure you're humble and understand you're just as guilty as everybody else without Christ. Let's take a moment and reflect upon our lives and make sure that our hearts are clean. And if we need to repent, let's do it. Repentance is freedom. Take a few moments with me, please. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for the cross. We are so grateful for your blood, your precious, sinless blood that was shed on Calvary for each and every one of us that are in this room right now. And Lord, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, may we never forget the words that were given to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 23, when he says, For I received from the Lord himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread. For every time you eat this bread, you remember the broken body of Jesus. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. Without the blood of Jesus, we have no life. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for the freedom found only in and through your Son. As we remember the cross, as we partake of the elements, as we reflect upon Christ, your Son, may we always remember the sacrifice that he gave us each and every day when we're going through our trials and tribulations in life. And Father, I pray for this body and this church. We have prayer for healing the first week of the month. Healing is a part of the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. By His stripes, we are healed. What that means is in the covenant of Christ, we are sealed for eternity. In the covenant of Christ, we are promised a resurrected body. In the covenant of Christ, we will rule and reign when Christ comes back to this earth. In Christ, we are healed in Jesus' name.